Thank you for liking and commenting on this story. I love to read what you have to say. If you haven't already, please push the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on a story. Above all, please share these stories with your friends so you can help the Black Dog Chronicles to continue. Sanctuary by Richard Paul Read by Hugh Carr I tend to go by Randall Britton these days, but my true name is Randall de Britolia. I am the second son of Alaric de Britolia, who, long ago, had been a knight and almost wealthy landowner, inheritor as he had been of the family's former holdings in Anglia taken from its Saxon owners and awarded to his grandfather in 1067 for the service he rendered to King William during the conquest. My father had always intended for his spare son to enter the church, his ambitions being bundled up tightly with his children. My elder brother, of course, was the future head of the family and inheritor of our father's wealth and lands. Whilst my two younger sisters were the means by which, through choice marriages, my father thought to expand his influence throughout the county. As for me, I was to join a reasonably new monastery built on the edge of some secluded woodlands not far from a scattering of nearby villages. I was expected to impress and shine and exceed my brothers in piety and sagacity and whatever other virtues might see me one day rise to the position of abbot. If, once I reached this high station, my considerable influence within the community proved to be of benefit to my family, then unquestionably this was just an extension of the high favor God certainly held us in. This was arrogant presumption, of course. Nevertheless, at the age of 15, I joined St. Cyril's Monastery as a novice. I quickly found that the monastic life suited me well. I was no man-at-arms like my father or brother. I was slighter and gentler of heart and bookish, very much my mother's son. The routine of religious service and work, both manual and studious, was almost addictive in its pleasantness and those congenial weeks turned into months and then a year, after which I took my vows with no hesitation and thought to spend my remaining days as a brother of the Priory, serving God as best I could, rather than my father's greed. I spent five more years in St. Cyril's, and they passed with the unfair swiftness that good years tend to. I still miss them. Anyway, it was near the end of that fifth year, six days after Christmas, when there came a desperate pounding on our door, and with it a singular, howled word, over and over again. Sanctuary! Abbot Orson a man almost as young as myself and full of the zeal often found by the young in leadership roles, ordered that the door be opened at once and the poor wretch brought out of the cold. This we did, and instead of the half-dead wastrel I expected to come shambling out of the December snow, we found an almost comely young man 
whose discomfort seemed to stem entirely from his worry rather than the cold's predations, for indeed he didn't so much as shiver as the door was closed behind him. Noting the abbot, he immediately fell to his knees, kissed his hand, and pleaded his case. Identifying himself as Bowden of Hemsby, he said he was a humble tenant farmer who, in his anger and carelessness, had killed his neighbor during a foolish fight stemming from some petty quarrel. A blow to the man's pate had set him falling backward, whereupon he'd struck his head on the jagged stone wall of a granary, and this had proved his death blow. This Bowden claimed that a group of the sheriff's men would not be far behind. This fact well pleased our abbot. When the second knock sounded at our door, he bade us all, including Bowden, stand beside him as he admitted the armed men and told them that their quarry had claimed sanctuary inside our monastery and, unless they would forsake their honor and imperil their souls by being so brazen as to try to steal a soul from God's own house, they would do well to return from whence they'd come. Before they could even answer this point, Orson launched into a well-practiced speech about the importance of sinners being granted every chance for true regret and repentance, and how to consign any such contested soul to the gallows was to grant to the devil a prize that might have possibly ascended to God's keeping. He said, and not for the first time, that it was proper for the local sheriff to seek holy counsel when making decisions on the fates of any criminal. He bade the four lawmen to go and tell him so. Whether they did or not is anyone's guess, but they did not storm our monastery, nor try by any means to seize our guest. I remember thinking at the time that this did them credit and nodded approvingly at their backs as they left. Perhaps I was right, despite what followed. Bowden proved a respectful, albeit undeniably peculiar addition to the monastery. He spent much time with Abbot Orson, who instructed him in matters of penance and the path of atonement he must follow. These and all other requirements of his stay he accepted with calm patience. As custom warranted, he would remain with us for a maximum of 40 days and after that go into exile from England, a fact that did not seem to trouble him over much. As night turned to day, we could not help but notice this man's eccentricities. When walking through almost any room, he would take odd serpentine routes, which we finally noticed was to avoid any hint of sunlight coming through the windows. Dim and fleeting as the winter light was, he avoided it as if it were boiling oil. This habit became more pronounced when he joined our work in the vegetable gardens where with a surely practice ease, he would always cling to the shadows of the closest wall. Or if he could not, he would bury himself in his wayfarer's cowl and ensure that no part of his skin was touched by the sun. The next oddity came at mealtimes. During a rare moment of conversation in the monastery, which I had chanced to overhear, I learned that Bowden had all but begged the abbot to allow him to join in the fasting that some of our order partook in. Orson, however, had refused this, stating that our charge would earn his keep through manual labor and thus must eat to keep up his strength. In practice, 
Bowden would sit in the most secluded corner of the refectory and eat, or seem to, with his back turned to us. As much of his meal as decency allowed for would be left untouched. The same was true of the milk and wine we gave him, and each bite or swallow seemed to require a conscious effort on his part, and he would wince as if he'd eaten hot coals. For all this, however, he gave no impression of seeming weak or famished. Ever was he strong and able with any task given to him. Furthermore, at no point did he ever look tired, nor can I recall ever seeing him yawn, nor pause to breathe during even the most rigorous labors. The final point of peculiarity was just how increasingly agitated Bowden seemed to get as the days passed, more so than circumstance would seem to warrant. His future seemed set. His soul, by the abbot's assurances, was not beyond hope of salvation, and he seemed almost eager to leave the country on the next ship for Normandy and never return. Yet to look at him when he thought no one was watching, you would see a twitching, mumbling, distracted man scratching at his arms, fighting an increasingly difficult battle to retain his composure. I would have asked what ailed him or alerted the abbot of his concerning behavior, but the particular vows I'd taken included a vow of silence. Besides, any attempt on my part to express my concerns would likely have been interpreted by Orson as my mind concocting fanciful notions to distract myself from my holy duties. The deeds of penance he contrived were often, let us say, overzealous. Therefore, I did nothing. Six days after Bowden arrived, I woke in the night to the sound of tortured screaming. I dashed from my cell and into the hall beyond, which was lit by only the barest sliver of moonlight. I searched about for my brothers, thinking to catch any glimpse of their silhouettes in the darkness, drawn out like myself by the ungodly howling from, as I now realized, Bowden's cell and Bowden's throat. But I saw no one else nearby. Had they somehow failed to notice the anguished screams? Or did the frightful sound trouble the hearts of my brothers so much that they dared not stir from their cells? I could not say and another scream from Bowden drew my mind from such questions. I edged my way through the darkness to his door and pushed it open with a shaking hand. He was on his bed, writhing atop it and screaming as if some horrendous melody tore at his innards. I ran to his side and grabbed at his shoulders, hoping to still his panicked motions and provide whatever assurance another's presence might. But the moment I touched the linen of his underclothes, I burned my hands. This was not the heat of flesh afflicted by a fever. This was as if I'd plunged my hands into an oven and though I touched the man for less than a second, I too could not help but fall back and scream, breaking my vow of silence, as I begged God to take the pain away. Bowden, not God, 
answered my prayer. Screaming no more, writhing no more, he walked over to me, grabbed me by one arm and hauled me to my feet as easily as one might lift a fallen apple from the grass. Even in the near total darkness, I saw every detail of his eyes. They were changed, widened, reddened and wrathful, beyond the bounds of human feeling, and they were less than a foot from my own. For the longest time, those horrible eyes simply stared into my terrified ones, whilst I strove to look anywhere else, tugging at the unbreakable, burning, agonizing grip around my arm. Had I a mind to appreciate the fact at the time, I might have noticed that there was no dulling of my senses nor my sanity for all this horror and pain. I felt everything. I remembered and still remember everything. I heard and smelt a host of nightmarish things and there was not the slightest sliver of comfort to be found in that moment of sheer evil sensation. Not in madness, not in insensibility, not in anything. Finally, it smiled. Its smile was a stretched, freakish thing, revealing far too many red fangs each one an overlong nightmarish dagger, each one wreathed in ancient, putrescent gore, each one edging closer to me. It spoke next, a sound that still freezes my soul. I'd hear it in my every dream, if only. I could still sleep. The words I will now relate cannot hope to do justice to the horrid occasion. Be grateful for that. This child thought I was gone. That my sport ended with the neighbor I bid him kill. He prayed to the air that my twistings and ministrations upon his flesh would reverse themselves, and he came here to this den of meatish things, as if it would somehow protect him from me. I fain destroy this place and take its meat. He still tries to resist me. I shall chastise him for his impudence. He'll not survive the revels to come, and his soul shall not escape my talons as I return home. Nonetheless, a new vessel must be carved from mortal flesh. And here you stand. Kindly, toothsome wretch. His mouth did something. I saw its silhouette shifting and writhing for a moment before that terrible head, shot forward and bit the side of my neck. The pain finally started to leave me just as my wits and my blood did. 
the moment of perfect clarity had passed, and I felt the world around me fall away as death came welcome in the wake of such an unescapable nightmare. I think he kissed me moments before I died. Six nights and a day passed, then my eyes opened, and I found myself buried a foot or so beneath the lettuce patch in the cloister gardens. Panic lent my shaking arms strength as I pushed my way to the surface, and as I stood up in the freezing night, wheezing out mud, I slowly started to return to my senses, only to realize they had changed. My mind wheeled back through what I remembered, trying to find some anchoring point of sanity I could cling to, but there was nothing. Looking around the monastery garden, one fact after another occurred to me, each one compounding the weight of unrelenting madness. The garden had been stripped of all life, every vegetable, every plant, every tenacious weed or blade of grass or sliver of moss on the walls was now a shriveled husk. I could hear no hint of owls, nor insects, nor any nocturnal creature. It was only the ghostly whistle of the wind. Next, I found that despite my standing naked in the open air, I could not feel the cold in the slightest. A moment later, as I tried to shiver from some panic sense of reflexive propriety, I realized that I was no longer breathing. Such was my shock that it took me a long time indeed to conclude that I was dead. Or at least significantly less alive than I had recently been. The third troubling fact was the unmistakable smell of blood. I could smell it everywhere even in far-off places, untouched by the wind. I could smell it and place it and realize that it was somehow far fresher than it should have been. But I could not understand how these revelations now came so easily. Somehow, less prominent to my altered nose were the smells of bile and burning. And worse, all were rife, yet all were secondary to the blood. The blood screamed to me and within me. It was a fact I felt in my very soul. I heeded it almost on instinct, seeking out the closest source despite the urgings of all reason to run far away. I followed those smells of death and soon found the first of my brothers. Brother Geoffrey, a friendly-faced, ever-smiling fellow, now with his limbs each wrenched from his torso, and his head nailed upside down to the stump of his neck. I can still see his final, unsmiling, torture-racked face if I close my eyes. I can 
still see all of them. Every mutilated, murdered brother of St. Cyril's monastery. I forget my father's face, my dear mother's, my siblings and all the acquaintances I've known since that ghastly night, sooner or later. But I remember the unnatural visages of my slain fellows. Brother Jeffreys was one of the more wholesome corpses I found in my old home. Overwrought to the point of insensate numbness at last, I wandered about the monastery and mutely found one ghoulish spectre of murder after another. I'll spare you a full accounting, more to deny it any satisfaction, rather than from any concern on my part, make no mistake. I can't ignore the worst, however, which was Abbot Orson, whom I found last. He was attached to the gate, somehow fused to it by some fell means. His guts lay strewn about the floor, where he had lately stood and welcomed Bowden, as he had dozens of poor sinners before him, a beastly reward for his constant mercy. More had been done to him. So much more. Whatever you're imagining, it was likely done to him. And likely not the worst. He was a dangling, dripping carpet, with most of a head attached. His lifeless eyes opened. His drooping, toothless mouth twisted into a hellish grin, and he howled at me. It was his voice, his tortured soul slithering back into his body for just a moment, just long enough to vent his anguish at me, before being taken off to a fate he did not deserve. Numbness failed me. I shrieked. I cowered. I waved my arms at the air between me and the haunted meat that was once the abbot. I called to God to deliver me from this overlong nightmare, to let me wake up in my cell for another peaceful day of serving and seeking him. He didn't answer. At last, I ran to the nearest suitable window and dove through the broken glass into the night air and ran as far away from St. Cyril's as I could. I didn't get tired, not something I realized at the height of my terror. Much like how a dozen wounds from broken glass tearing at my skin healed in mere moments. And indeed I ran as fast as I could with no burning in my lungs nor my legs. I ran until by sheer luck I was stopped by a brace of bandits lurking by the road that I chanced to find myself on. Perhaps they were lying in wait for pilgrims or peddlers or any luckless traveler who'd not chanced upon a place to rest before nightfall. These two grizzled, weather-beaten wretches took one look at my naked self and laughed a malevolent laugh that would have terrified me not so long ago. In short order, however, I was laughing too. After what I'd escaped, that these two mundane little men might feign to harm me was hilarious beyond measure. They didn't seem to get the joke, alas. 
mad naked fool running down the road at midnight, one said, walking up to me. Lucky for you, boy. I'm feeling generous tonight, so I'll end you before the cold does. In a single quick motion, he drew a rusty kitchen knife and plunged it deep into my gut. It hurt, of course, but the pain was slight and distant, no worse than catching your shin on a table. I kept laughing, even as he twisted the blade. His evil smirk vanished, and sudden horror that was oddly gratifying to see on someone else arose in him and his companion, seized by a sudden hunger and the whispers of an instinct not entirely my own, I turned my teeth to fangs, grabbed the outlaw who stabbed me, bit his oh. neck and drank deep of his blood. His dunce of a friend stood dumbfounded and gawping, only thinking to run when I dropped his partner and advanced on him. But by then, it was far too late. When I drank the last drop of this pauper's blood and let his body fall to the ground for the crows to see off, I saw Bowden again, or at least what had been Bowden till recently. There were still plenty of torn, stretched bits of flesh and clothing clinging to the demon shape glaring at me. The hair was on fire. From the fire came mostly female screams. How quickly you adapt, little monk. How quickly your faith is shattered. You shall make a fine vessel. Go now. Seek shelter from the sun and the consequences of your murders. You will see me again, boy. And together we'll forge a scene to make the one you ran from seem feeble beside it. The screams of the world shall be your knell. Till that time, my herald and scold you shall be. Inform this world of our displeasure. Await my return. With that, he vanished, descending back to hell, perhaps, heading off to make more scenes, perhaps. I cannot say, as I've yet to meet the bastard again since that night, which was 927 years ago, and in that time, I've not seen the slightest hint of such demons, nor their depredations. Indeed, as far as I can tell, there are no historical mentions of a massacre at St. Cyril's Monastery, nor any record of any such monastery ever existing. I went back there one day, having built up my courage slowly over two centuries. There was nothing there. No ruin, no ancient foundation, no unspeakably mutilated skeletons, not a thing. When I fled that scene for a second time before the break of dawn, I confess myself relieved, letting myself believe for a moment that the first and worst night of my new life could not be possibly be real, so proved by the lack of evidence. That delusion 
didn't last long. I am the evidence. Sharp minds will have realized that I am a revenant. Or, as you call us now, a vampire. Back in my day, such creatures were one more story designed to keep children from straying too far from their houses, or to explain away their disappearances if they did so, and never came back. The lore told in those ancient tales was accurate enough to keep me fed and out of the sun during the early days, yet the whole truth of my new existence remained a mystery to me. What precisely were we? How had we come to be? Were we still human to any real degree? When I'd finally developed a sufficient degree of curiosity, I began a quest to seek out others of my kind. Others who might be able to share answers. I searched the world, starting in the town of Yarmouth, then wandering through England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, feeding as I went on outlaws in the woods, or the dying in towns and cities, whose passing I could somewhat ease. Time and again I found telltale signs of vampires in the places I went, bodies with wounds about the neck and a severe sudden lack of blood, crude dens in deep shadowy places into which no mortal would likely blunder, and no one would hear them scream if they did. More than this, however, I could sense the presence of my kind. It was a strange sense of certainty in my mind that another vampire was near. I've never actually met one. In almost a thousand years of life, I have only seen one other like myself and only then because they were slower than the others in running away from me. Though she did manage to elude me in the end. The others can sense me as I can sense them, and without fail they always flee when they feel me coming. My search was a furious, fanatical crusade at one time in my life, but age and weariness have degenerated it to something of a lazy hobby. Time and again, when I'm of a mood to look, I've found lairs showing signs of recent habitation by my people and hasty evacuation. I've smelt the unmistakable hint of blood. I've seen collections of old trinkets from erstwhile lives or collections of finger bones in one strange instance. I've seen chained prisoners kept, so that meals can be had for several days, always hastily slain before my marks ran for the hills, presumably to ensure they'd spill no secrets. I've seen improvised imitations of family homes where two or more vampires live together, so evidently it is not in our nature to flee each from the other. They simply cannot abide my presence. A hundred or so years ago, I tried leaving a letter in one of these lairs, promising the occupant that I meant no harm, telling my tale and asking them to leave another letter in turn with whatever law they could share with me, which I would collect in six days when I returned. When I did return, I found the lair had been burned down, along with my letter, and I believe with every possession the occupant had kept within. There was a body, and for another half-century I honestly thought I'd driven this 
attempted pen pal to suicide until I sensed them again in Berlin. They had gone to some very extreme lengths in an attempt to evade me. Or perhaps not me, exactly. Anyway, over the past two decades, I've seen increasing signs of a vampiric online presence. Vampires using the veil of the internet to wheedle their way into the tempting realm of mortal life. Be it for dinner's sake, or nostalgias, or regrets, or whatever else. I've tried to reach out to my panicky countrymen in this manner as well, tracking down the true creatures behind the online facades. And even there, they flee from me. The closest I ever came to a conversation was with one youth, who I assume was newly turned who typed the following at me before signing out of the primitive 2002 chat room and then possibly fleeing the city. Get the fuck away from me, you demon-made bastard. Just fucking die. If I was still the kindly monk I was, i probably stop hunting for vampires who don't want to talk to me. If I were more like my brother, I would take this hunt seriously and contrive a decent snare for my prey. But I am old and tired and more than slightly bitter. I enjoy this peculiar chase. I enjoy driving my cowardly kith to flight, time after time. I enjoy the thought of their sinking faces and growing dread when they sense me drawing near. There is solace in curiosity and petty maliciousness. That said, Sooner or later, I shall apply myself properly to the task and lay my hands on another vampire. I know how I may do it. I shall not permit them to leave my presence until I learn one way or another just why they are so terrified of me. Just what nightmarish fate they run from. I dare say it'll make for a memorable scene.